All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, Clark, for the music. <laughs> thank Larry for today's illustration. I love it, but all I can hear is da 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 and a woman on a bicycle. I'll get you dumb dog Toto, too. But uh, Larry was trying to find something that might represent our subject today. So thank you, buddy. I think that looks cool. Hope all of you are doing well. This is the, uh, is this the 18th or the 17th of October? It's the 17th of October. I'm looking at my watch and trying to count days to it. October 17th, I hope that you're blessed. On the 29th of October is going to be our next Friday night light. And it's going to be here in room 7 and 8. And it's going to be a night of pumpkin. It's going to be a night of nacho bar and potato bars. We're asking you to bring a pumpkin dessert of some type, whatever you wish. Pumpkin pie, pumpkin cake, pumpkin muffins, whatever you might have with pumpkin and a pumpkin roll. And uh, you don't have to think about feeding 20 people because uh, yeah, I'm thinking about a pumpkin roll. They're pretty small, but we should have a number of different desserts that people can share from. And uh, we are going to have a nacho bar and a potato bar. And uh, Bob Knox said last Saturday we're going to be having pumpkin bingo, whatever that means. But that will be the event of the night. What's that? Halloween bingo. Halloween bingo. I guess that is what he said. Okay. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. you got to come. It's going to start at 6 o'clock on a Friday the 29th of October. So let's pray and we'll get into our next issue on some mornings. God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for your blessing and, and guide us in your grace in all that we do. And Lord, help us in understanding and what is, in my opinion, a very dangerous teaching that comes out of the church. So Lord, lead us in this as we look at the subject of the rapture. Thank you, God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Some warnings. The rapture. What does it mean? What is it? Do I, should I believe in it? Is it real? Is it true? Is it, is it something I should even give two sheets about? Well, before I answer any of that, let me tell you the words of Colin Brown. Colin Brown was a professor at Fuller Seminary of systematic theology and philosophy. And when we were taking modern systematics, he was talking about this particular teaching. And I remember him saying, he said, you know, in, in England, we have a garage in which we park our automobiles. So it's unlike the United States of America where you guys have a garage, which is quite large, can fit two cars. I have a three car garage in the house I live in. He said, in England, our garages are rather small because so are our cars. And you only have enough room in there to stick your car in and get out and you shut it. But that's where your car goes. So, so I move to the United States of America and I come out to California and I get a house which has this really big garage. Notice the difference he says between garage and garage. He said, because I want you to know I'm living in the United States. He said, and what I learned in the United States is your garage is not for your automobile. You park, you park your automobile outside two or three at a time. So what is the garage for? He says the garage there in the United States of America for the vast majority of homes that you go by is the place that you put the junk that you have nowhere in your house or no use of it. So all the stuff that you've had that you just can't get rid of because it means something to you or to somebody, you put it out in the garage. If, for instance, your Aunt Sally gave you this painting. Now you think it's absolutely hideous. It's horrible. You want to burn it. But your Aunt Sally gave it to you. And you know what's going to happen. Aunt Sally's going to come to your house one day to visit. And the first thing she's going to look for is what? The painting. The painting. Where is the painting? And what are you going to say, Aunt Sally? I hate it. No. And so you want to take that picture out of your garage and hang it up so that Aunt Sally can be blessed when she comes to visit your house. And you hope nobody comes by when Aunt Sally comes by because then they'll see this hideous picture and say, what the boop is that? 
Is the other thing you hope for is that Aunt Sally doesn't just show up that she calls you before she's coming, because otherwise she's going to walk in the house and say, where's that picture I gave you? He said, the rapture is the garage for all the junk in the Bible that we can't put anywhere else. And we throw it into one teaching, and we call it the rapture, and we say, here's what it is. I remember when, when Colin Brown said that, I had to laugh my head off, and so did many other people in the room. Because before I go any further, I want to tell you that what people call the rapture and what they tell you it teaches, I challenge you to find in this book because you can't find it. It isn't there. Now, we're going to look at the verse, which is what it's based on. But please understand, the rapture teaches this, that there's going to come a time when Jesus is going to come back, which we're all waiting for, aren't we? Aren't we all waiting for the Lord's return? And he's going to take from the earth believers. He's going to take them away before the tribulation starts. And the people who have walked with Jesus, which by the way, in this teaching, are Gentiles. They're going to be raptured away from the earth and brought up to heaven to live in heavenly glory. And then there's going to be a great tribulation of seven years where there's all, well, all hell is going to break loose. And during that time, the Jews who are left behind, because they're not followers of Jesus, according to this teaching, not, not me. The Jews then are going to come in mass to believers in Jesus. And then at the end of seven years, there's going to be peace. The reign of God is going to rule in the hands of Jewish believers for 1,000 years. And then at the end of the 1,000 years, all hell is going to break loose again. For another seven years, there's going to be war till finally the angel Gabriel and his army is going to defeat the demons of the devil, and the devil will finally be thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus is going to come back again for now a third time, first time walking with us, second time to, to rapture, third time, and bring the Jews up, and we're all going to have a happy gay old time in heaven together. I challenge you to find any of that in the scripture. It's just not there. The rapture as a teaching. If anybody ever tells you about the doctrine of the rapture, I'm sorry, a doctrine is something a council representing the church votes on. And then it becomes doctrine. The newest doctrine in the church, and in this case, the Catholic church, is the doctrine of What's the thing that happens every Christmas? My mind just went. Immaculate. Thank you. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is the newest doctrine in the history of church written in the 19th century. Now, here's something about the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. It was first postulated in the 7th century in Christianity. It was brought up every time a council of the church would get together. It finally was voted on as a doctrine in the 1800s, and I think it was voted as a doctrine just so that these people keep saying, we need this, we need this, would stop saying it, and they voted it as a doctrine, and it's all left alone ever since. And what I get a kick out of is the vast majority of people who say, oh, oh, I believe in the Immaculate Conception, they don't even know what it teaches. Please note, that became a doctrine, but it was first presented in the seventh century. The teaching of the rapture, which is not a doctrine, first appears, you guys know when? Do you have any idea when this teaching first appears? 1830. That's when it first appears. In other words, prior to 1830, unlike the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, the teaching of the rapture is less than 200 years old. If this was such a, 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 a biblically based teaching, why did it just begin not even 200 years ago? But it was started by a man named Darby, who 
was preceded by a 16-year-old young woman named Margaret McDonald who had a vision in 1825 about members of the church being taken from the earth. This is where it all starts. She has this vision, people are talking about it. And, and John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren Church in England wrote it down as a teaching, the rapture, and went on from there. So we're talking about something very, very new as far as the Christian church goes. The thing I get about the rapture is the fact that where does that word come from? Rapture. Because what does rapture mean? It means a euphoric sense of love. An overwhelming feeling of joy about something going on. The comic Bloom County. Otis, Otis, Opus, the penguin, was talking to Milo Bloom about something that he just got so overjoyed about. And he's telling Milo about this great thing, which is really a bunch of nonsense. But at the end of it, Milo's dancing and he says, oh, rapture. And I, I got a kick out of it because here was a modern comic Using the word correctly, it's an overwhelming sense of joy. Well, people say, well, do you believe in the rapture? What is that? That's, that's when the, the church is going to be taken from the earth. Where does that come from? Because that's not what the word means. Let's go to today's reading. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. By the way, some interesting stuff about the church in Thessalonica. They all believed in the imminent return of Jesus, the imminent return of Jesus, so much so that many of the people in the church weren't working. They had quit their jobs, and they were then demanding the people of the church to feed for them. Because after all, what did Jesus say about the hungry? Feed them. What about the naked? Love them. The thirsty? Give them a drink. Okay, we're not going to talk about prison or because that's not where they were. So if you read... The, Thess the letters of Thessalonians, especially the second one, you're going to, in the second one, you're going to hear Paul or read Paul say, if a so-called brother will not work, neither let him eat. That's rather harsh. But the fact is these people were sitting around. They, they, they knew Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. They weren't doing anything. And part of that is what goes into what I'm about to read to you here. Because what was going on while they were waiting for the imminent return of Jesus, is that people were doing what? They were dying. As we get older, we, we die. I was really impressed by the words of William Shatner, who went into space yesterday when he landed. He said, I'm 90 years old. I'm closer to death today than I ever have been in my life. And going up in that spacecraft and looking at the darkness of space, as opposed to the vivid colors of the earth below us, to me, it was a vivid reminder that there is death and there is life. And I have to enjoy this beautiful globe for as long as I can, because I'm facing that darkness someday. People in the church of Thessalonica were dying. And since the people of Thessalonica believed in the imminent return of Jesus, they began saying, well then, what happens to my loved ones who have died, who aren't going to be here when Jesus comes back? Are they going to miss meeting together with God in glory because they died before that return? This was a real issue for them. So Paul, on that concern, writes this. 1 Corinthians 4, 13 and following. Brothers and sisters. Thessalonians. What did I say? Corinthians. Oh, geez, Louise. Thank you, Larry. Different city. So somebody has to listen. <laughs> for... <laughs> Never mind, I almost made a political joke. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and following. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. What's that mean? Die. Die. Another metaphor. Jesus himself used it when he talked about Nazareth, uh, Nazareth about Lazarus. 
And when they said, well, Lord, if Lazarus is asleep, certainly he'll wake up. So Jesus had to say, Lazarus is dead. So he's talking about the people that have died. We don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of the people who have no hope. Now, I'm going to stop right there before we even get to the image or the area which leads to this. I have met people who will tell you that the death of a loved one, if you're in Jesus, you will never cry. We celebrate because someone has received new life in Jesus. We will not cry. I have told you about the time I went to the man's house whose wife had just died. He was 92. She was 91. They had been married for 72 years. And when I got there, her, their 60-year-old daughter answered the door. And I said, I'm sorry. And she put her hand on my mouth and said, no, no, there's no sorry here. We are celebrating my mother. If you're sorry, you're not welcome. So I went, praise be to Jesus. Can I see you, Dad? Paul doesn't say, I don't want you to, to mourn. That's where that teaching comes from. Talking about things being taken out of context. Paul doesn't say don't mourn. Paul says, I don't want you to grieve or mourn, as some translations say, like the rest of the world who have no hope. We have a hope, amen? amen. And when someone dies and we know they're in Jesus, we are sorrowful, but at the same time, we can celebrate because we know that person lives again. But this idea, we won't mourn. I don't know where that comes from. Paul says, don't mourn as those who have no hope. In all the funerals I've done in my life, I have been at the funerals where there is no religious connection in any way, shape, or form. And folks, I got to tell you, that mourning is sorrowful and it hurts. And my wish for such people is right then, right there, they would give their life to Jesus. Paul isn't saying don't mourn. Can we knock that off? What did Jesus do when he got to the tomb of Lazarus? He cried. He cried. I always say if Jesus is our model, if he can cry at the tomb of someone whom he loved, what does that mean for us? We can. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I've shared this story before when Larry's dad died. And I grabbed Bill and I grabbed Al. And the three of us came to Larry, and Larry told them what he had already told me. My dad just died. And the four of us stood there arm in arm, and Larry wept. And I was so glad that no one said a thing. I was so glad. It was like Job's friends when they first showed up. They, they, they wept with Job. They didn't say anything to him. Death hurts. Death hurts. But those in Christ Jesus will live again. Don't mourn as those who have no hope. But go ahead and mourn. Now let me get on. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. We all get to go. We all get to be a part of the party. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, look, I'm not going to get into the argument about the, you, you know, the, the Seventh-day Adventist and death sleep and all of that. Just hear the words of Paul. He's trying to tell people, your loved ones aren't going to be missed. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, what did I say last week? You want to know what the main point somebody says, look for the what? Therefore. The therefore. You know what comes in the very last line here? Therefore. Therefore. There's a therefore. So what's Paul's main point? Therefore, 
encourage each other with these words, or as the New American Standard translates it, comfort each other with these words. What, in everything Paul says here in this paragraph, what is his hope? Is that we'll be comforted about those that have died. They're not going to miss out. That's what he's trying to comfort these people in, in, in Thessalonica. And hopefully as we read today, it comforts us. If someone dies before us, they are not going to miss out because they no longer live on the earth when Jesus comes back. We are all going to be there. Now, the one thing Paul says is the dead rise first and then those of us who, who are alive, we're going to join them and everything's great. Amen? Amen. Therefore, comfort each other with these words. That is what Paul wrote this about. He wanted us to be comforted at the point of the death of our loved ones. What does that have to do with the teaching of the rapture? Well, did you hear the main word in there? After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's where the rapture begins, right there. That's where this whole teaching begins. It's right there. Caught up together. Remember what I told you in the beginning? It, the rapture teaches that the church is going to be raptured, caught up, taken to God, and then tribulation is going to go on, and the Jews get to come and, and be a part of the kingdom again. Again, that's the teaching of the rapture. That's not my teaching. So please, I'm not trying to say the Jews aren't included. If you've ever listened to anything I said, you know that the, 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 the grace of God is for all people, all languages, all tribes, all nations, including the Jews, who are coming to know Jesus in great numbers every day here on our earth today. But you see, the rapture starts right there, 2 Corinthians, uh, second, 4 Thessalonians. I'm sorry. 4 First. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that phrase will be caught up together. And by the way, it appears in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 also, but Paul is talking about something totally different. He says, I knew a man who was caught up to the seventh heaven. It's the same word, caught up. So what's the word? The word is Hufardzo, or arpaxo, depending on which way you look at the Greek. And it means to be taken by force. It means to be caught up. It means to be grabbed. It means to be taken violently. That's what the word means. Hufardzo, arpaxo. Caught up, taken. That's what's written right here in 1 Thessalonians. Those who are left will be caught up together, taken by force. You may be saying, well, wait a minute, what's that got to do with the word rapture? Thank you for asking. When the Greek text was translated into Latin into the Vulgate, this word arpaxo became rapturzo, from a Latin word meaning to take. When the Vulgate was translated into English, and by the way, what was the first word used there? Well, I mean, first text, King James, it was based on the Vulgate. That word rapturzo became caught up, but they began transliterating it to rapture. That's where it comes from, folks. It takes the word totally out of context of what the word really means. Here it is. We're going to be raptured together. We're going to be caught up together. Now, again, what did Paul say? What was his whole point of all this? That we'd be comforted, that we're not going to be left out, and neither are our dead loved ones who preceded us before the Lord comes back. But this gets tur turned into an entire teaching based on one word. The word also appears in Revelation. You were talking about that earlier, Bob and Peg, about Revelation. It appears in Revelation chapter 12 when it says 
the child who is given birth to by this woman, the dragon grabs the child in his mouth. The dragon has the child in his mouth. It says, but the, dra the child was, same word, caught up, ripped out, taken away violently by force and taken off into the wilderness and protected by God. That's an image of the church. And what does it say? It has been taken out of the mouth of the dragon. Well, if the dragon in Revelation is the devil, which is what it clearly says in the book of Revelation, then here's something I always say whenever I teach about that. Whenever you think about the dragon, the fact that the church was taken out of the dragon's mouth by force, what came with it? It's teeth. I mean, if something has been violently yanked out of another thing's mouth, its teeth are gone. That's why I try to say, don't be afraid of the, of the devil. We even read it last week in my Bible study. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil runs around like a roaring lion, but he's not a roaring lion. And I, I said that night, he is a defeated, toothless dragon, but it's the same word. So people will look at that word, and if this child is in the church and the child is caught up, what do we have? Ah, oh, the rapture. And what happens after that? Well, that's when we jump over to Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 and 41. And this is where they start putting the puzzle pieces. Remember what I said Colin Brown said? The garage for the garbage you have no place for anywhere else? We take Matthew chapter 24, which says, one will be taken, the other will be left behind. One will be taken, another will be left behind. People say, see, see, see that, that, that's the rapture, that's the rapture. One's being taken, people get left behind. You don't want to be left behind. Remember what I said about being left behind a couple of weeks ago? Veronica got a huge kick out of it. And I said, well, people say, well, what happened to those who are left behind? I said, I don't care. They become Smurfs and they live in mushrooms. And Veronica started laughing. She came singing to me the, 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 the Smurf song at the end of the worship service. I don't care. The point of what Jesus is talking about is don't be left behind. But he's not saying, well, therefore, spend a lot of time on left behind. But they'll say, see, that's the rapture to be taken. That's the rapture of people left behind for the tribulation and, and all of this junk that they teach. The problem is, if we're going to be looking at the word arpaxo, arparzo, it doesn't even appear in Matthew. The taken is a different word. The taken in Matthew, it, <laughs> I know you're going to want to say this one again, is paralambano. Thank you. <laughs> paralambano. It's a whole different word. Doesn't even have any root together with our podzo. Paralambano, which means taken. It's a whole different word. And for people to look at that and go, well, see, that's the rapture. They're then taking a teaching from another part of the scripture text, attaching it to this part of the scripture text, and saying it's the same thing when it's not. Remember what I said last week about logic? All Cadillacs have four wheels. A Volkswagen has four wheels, therefore a Volkswagen is a Cadillac. It doesn't fit. You don't take one word from one spot and put it on another and say, well, therefore it's the same thing. It's not. Two different Greek words, folks. Colin Brown was absolutely correct. This people take a little bit here, a little bit there, and they try to put it all together, try to make a nice cake out of it. But all they have is a mess. I'd rather look at what the scripture text says. You know what the book of Revelation says seven times in chapter two and chapter three? That's you do. It was repeated seven times. Chapter two and chapter three of Revelation. Peg is looking it up. To the one who endures. endures. Some translations say overcomes. Seven times to the one who who endures, and that is followed with a promise. I will give you the crown of life. You get to dwell in my house forever. Seven promises follow all seven times, it says, to the one who endured. Last week when we were in Colossians, we saw a similar verse. Therefore, you might endure 
The message in the scripture text is we will endure. We've been looking at 1 Peter in my Bible study and it's talking about those who are going to be persecuted and the blessing of those who come out of that because Jesus will restore them. It, it doesn't say those who vanish and get raptured away. Those who survive. Peter, I'm sorry, Paul says to Timothy, all those who are in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The thing about the rapture is what it's trying to teach is, oh, don't worry about that. We won't be here. Well, if that happens to be your teaching, you're going to have to show it to me because it simply isn't there. And don't take me to the verses I shared today because I'm going to argue with you. We are here for the long haul, folks. Blessed are you when people persecute you and accuse you falsely because of me rejoice and be exceedingly glad this modern teaching not even 200 years old which is trying to tell people don't worry about the end times because you're not going to be there brothers and sisters it isn't biblical it isn't biblical now one thing about the rapture that bothers me more than anything else is it changes an age-old cliche what's that cliche when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Tough get going. But according to the teaching of the rapture, when the going gets tough, the tough's going to vanish, so don't worry about it. That's dangerous teaching to me, folks. Dangerous teaching. And I didn't even get into stuff about pre and post and all millennial and all that junk. Just please understand, it isn't biblical. And if somebody comes to you and say, well, what's your position on, on the rapture? The best answer you can give to them is, I'm not going to talk about something that isn't biblical. And that's my advice to you. Read 1 Peter if you haven't read it. The promise is, is that God's presence will be with us even in the midst of persecution. And after it's over with, we are going to be filled with God's blessing. Hallelujah. Will all survive? No. Will all be persecuted? Well, according to the scripture text, yes. Can any of that separate us from the love of God we have in Christ? I don't need a rapture, especially one that can't be backed up by the scripture text, folks. And you'll hear it, and you'll hear people teach it. Not even 200 years old. Can't believe how many people follow this stuff. God will be with you no matter what happens. He says, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the age. Well, if we aren't supposed to be here at the end of the age, why would he need to say? God lead us in this and other teachings which frighten us, which confuse us. And personally for me, it angers me because it isn't biblical. And there are people who are going to hear this sermon who are going to be angry at me for saying it because they're going to tell, say I'm wrong. Well, show it to me and I'll believe in it, but you can't. So, Lord, lead us in wisdom. We thank you that you will be with us. We thank you that our loved ones who preceded us in death are not going to miss out. And what a wonderful.